You are here for a fireside chat with Danny Shish Kandalaja, who is currently the chief executive um, at Oxfam uh, GB, and with Baroness Lola Young, who's also one of our chairwomen um, of our board. So it's great to have both of them here with us this evening, and I'm going to hand over to Lola to facilitate this conversation. Over to you, Lola. Thank you, Joe, and good evening, everybody, in these slightly strange circumstances. I, I, Tempted to say, Danny, it's lovely to be sitting here with you, and we kind of are sitting together, so let, let, let's take it as that. But, uh, I'd um, rather be in Mayfair if that's all right, but home will do. Actually, I'm not in Mayfair, so um, yeah, I'm in <laughs> North London. But um, yeah, so, so and obviously the reason why we're doing this in this particular format is because of the extraordinary circumstances under which we're currently living. And... Um, we feel it particularly keenly here, but obviously this is a global, global ph phenomenon. We're talking about a pandemic. So COVID-19, the kind of evil word that we'll all invoke in the future. But seriously, what does that actually mean in terms of an, a strategy for Oxfam? Because surely I think we're all quite well aware that there's huge amounts of very vulnerable people in our own societies, but also elsewhere across the world. How, to what extent does this derail what Ox, o, Oxfam was planning to do? What, what is your strategy for coping with these extraordinary circumstances? Yeah, well, look, I suspect like everyone listening or watching, um, it's, you know, one of the strangest things about where we are is the, is the uncertainty of all. I don't, I, you know, I don't quite know how anyone can plan anything, including our sort of own personal lives, let alone, you know, organizational strategy. And in fact, at Oxfam Great Britain, you know, I've been chief exec now for just over a year and was in fact, as you say, Lola, planning to do a whole new strategy. In fact, this time was supposed, was set aside to do some of the pre-launch activities for a bold new strategy. And, you know, all of that has been put aside as we try to grapple with and manage the implications of the, of this pandemic. And, Again, like I suspect everyone listening, um, that's involved huge change. You know, all of our team, we've got two and a bit thousand people who work at Oxfam Great Britain are now working largely from home. Um, we are trying to manage the cost implications. and um, But most importantly, as you say, trying to um, think about how can an organization like ours that's been around for almost 80 years at the forefront of both sort of humanitarian concern, but also a sense of internationalism, how can we put that network, those resources, our people and experience to best effect to respond? And I think, you know, one of the things we're finding is that some of, some of the first things we need to be doing, and we, our teams across the world are already starting, is around just basic public health. I mean, the same messages we in the UK are being given around washing our hands. Um, we need to get those messages across in, in some of the most, you know, some of the poorest and most vulnerable communities. And so I've now, I've been heartened amongst all of, you know, I've been working who knows how many hours these last few weeks, but every time I see on our internal communication platform, pictures of colleagues distributing soap in refugee camps in, um, in Jordan, or the other day I saw that our colleagues are already distributing hygiene kits amongst displaced people in Yemen. Uh, some of the public health volunteers that we had in places like the DRC that were doing Ebola response are now working on public health education in um, in, in the COVID response. And so I think there's a, a series of activities that we're, we're just doing and um, as, as part of our response. But importantly, also just highlighting the deep inequities of the situation that we're in. You know, rightly, I mean, almost everyone in the world is worried about um, the impacts of this pandemic. But, you know, we already know that if even the world's best health systems are struggling to cope, um, you know, one can't even start to think about what's going to happen in the global south. You know, in Spain has one doctor for every 250 residents. Zambia has one doctor for every 10,000 people. Um, mm. Or I was, there was found out that Mali, the whole country of Mali only has three ventilators that work at the moment. So, you know, that when this pandemic hits, and it's really a question of when it hits some of the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet, who don't have necessarily the the means to um, to the, the access to health systems or even the means to just survive major disruption, that's when we'll see the most I think tragic impacts of this pandemic. So, Danny, in terms of public consciousness in this country and indeed elsewhere in Europe and and, and the West in general, 
obviously there's a, there, there's a tendency to sort of turn inward and think about our own particular problems and how we're going to cope with self-isolation, et cetera, et cetera. And as you say, ventilators are a problem here, never mind, you know, elsewhere. So how do you get, how, how do we get people to think about the very, very near, near future? Because as you say, it's a question of more than if this pandemic goes truly global and begins to hit some of those poor communities. What, what, what can we do or what can Oxfam do? What does Oxfam do in order to alert people here and now what is going to happen down the line? So I think the, um, the first thing we're doing and many other agencies are doing is, is just using our own internal resources, staff time, volunteer time to start to be part of the response because every day counts now. Um, and so we've got our own internal fac uh, funding mechanism. We have a, something called an emergency fund within Oxfam that we can um, use to underwrite quick response. And we're doing that. We're calling on, on governments uh, and, in fact, some of our corporate and donor partners as well to see if we can get going already with the response. Because you're right, it's, it's very unlikely that anywhere in the world um, people are quite ready to talk, think about um, you know, what's happening outside their own context and outside their own country. And it, it would feel a bit tone deaf if organizations like ours went out, for example, to the British public today and said, look, help us with the response elsewhere. But I think that time will come because you know, there will be a time when, when countries in Europe or in, in the North will have got over the worst of this. But it's that, you know, all the projections I've seen suggest that's probably the time when countries in the South are going to be feeling the worst impacts. And, and I hope, you know, that's that's the that's to me the really important message here around isolation and um, and and interconnectedness. You know, this pandemic shows more clearly than anything I've ever seen in my life how deeply interconnected we are. And to stay safe, we have to isolate and self-isolate. That's really important. We, but if we're going to stay safe in the long term, we have to make sure that everyone else is safe as well. Um, you know, and a pandemic proves that in a deeply interconnected world, we need to go out of our way to provide, you know, basic public services, free accessible health care, the safety nets that will mean that we can minimize the impact of, uh, of, of things like pandemics, but also make sure that everyone is on uh, as level a playing field as possible. And um, I hope that's the lesson that we all draw in the long, long term out of out of this crisis that we obviously have to manage in the short term. I think there's another uh, fear that I hear being expressed by um, charities uh, around the place who have these big, big issues that they're focusing on. And I want to take us now into thinking a bit more about climate change. Um, so there's a feeling that everything else is sort of on the back burner because of COVID-19, but of course it isn't. I mean, climate change isn't waiting for us to get over this before it, it ramps up again. So you've been talking about, in terms of Oxfam, you've been talking about uh, the transition, the transition, a just transition to a decarbonized future. Can you say a little bit about what that actually means and also the extent to which that that also is about addressing the vulnerable communities around the world wherever they might be yeah i mean that's right i mean this year for oxfam was going to be a year in which we as a confederation you know there are ten thousand of us who work in 91 countries we're going to focus on this notion of a just transition or climate justice and it's because we really did think that not enough attention was being paid to the real impact climate breakdown is having on on again the poorest and most marginalized people on the planet and um, we want to draw attention to the fact that climate uh, uh, breakdown was having an impact today right here right now on people you know, last year we had the privilege of receiving some high school students from Malawi here in the UK and um, two really amazing ambassadors um, talking about the impact climate change of flooding and droughts um, were having on their own communities, their ability to go to school, their parents' livelihoods. And they came here at the time when UK students were demonstrating on the streets. And many of the UK students were holding up signs that said, save our future. And Jesse and Isaac from Malawi uh, were saying, save our today. And saying that, you know, these are impacts that they are feeling already. And I think that for us is the, a critical part of this notion of a just transition that we have to 
thing change, um, and so also about the cause. You know, we think our estimates suggest that the, ten, the livelihoods of the richest 10% of us on the planet, that's probably people like you and me and, uh, and us, others listening, if you take sort of global population, are responsible for half of all emissions mm -hmm. on the planet. Um, or put another way, just in the first two weeks of the year, the average Brit will have emitted more carbon or be responsible for more carbon than the average Rwandan or the average Ugandan or the aver, um, uh, average Ethiopian. And that's the sort of inequ inequity the, um, that we're seeing when it comes to climate change. And so we need a sort of redistribution in terms of both the sort of responsibilities as well as the, um, the mitigation and adaptation um, accessible to, to people in the global south. And then there's also an, a, an intergenerational aspect of this, that we cannot have a just transition um, if we don't start to think about intergenerational equity here. Um, and I think that's going to be part of, a, of an urgent mix um, that uh, we need to take into account. So we're seeing um, an increasing um, amount of uh, climate refugees. Um, do we have any kind of numbers on that? Um, roughly how many, where are they, who are the most affected? Could you say something about that, please? Yes, it's incredibly difficult, obviously, to, um, to work, work this out precisely, partly because <laughs> We don't, you know, I remember, in fact, 10 years ago, talking to a, a senior BBC um, science correspondent, and I was working on climate displacement then, and he, and he said to me, look, Danny, where, where can I go to get footage of, people, of climate refugees leaving their homes? And I said, well, you can't, because most people who, who leave or are displaced because of climate change, um, uh, you know, climate change is one of several factors that's going to be pushing them out of where they are. It might be that, you know, because of climate breakdown, harvests fail more often, or because of drought, a livelihood is just that less, you know, you're less able to sustain a, a decent livelihood in where you live. And so it's likely to contribute to the push factors that drive displacement. Um, and so there are sort of complex interactions between climate breakdown, poverty, and other forms of injustice that I think are at heart here. But that said, you know, Oxfam colleagues in the last uh, couple of months have done an analysis where we think if you look back over the last 10 years, 200 million people around the world have been displaced because of an extreme weather event, a drought or a cyclone or a wildfire. Um, and that's, you know, people have often been displaced within their own country, so they're internally displaced people. But, you know, that's a phenomenal number of people that we're already talking about. You know, the last 10 years have been nowhere near as dramatic in terms of their impacts on, on these people as the next few decades are going to be. Um, and yet we're already seeing even the most acute forms of climate displacement happening at the, at the sort of staggering levels um, today. I was going to ask you a question about how to support governments in building climate resilience, and I hope we'll come to that. But I've got a question that's come in from our audience from, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, Supana Malhotra. And um, uh, the question is, do you think that this pandemic that is currently going on will be a good motivation for governments actually to do something about climate change? Do you think there could be an interconnection there? I certainly hope so. Um... I suppose it's it's very early to think about exactly uh, you know what the ramifications and fallouts of this cri of, the, of the pandemic is, uh, are going to be, but I, one can imagine a few things going on. I mean, the first is that this is such a massive disruption to the global economy as we know it, and some of those basic assumptions we had around you know how we all live and consume. You know, I'm I'm at home with with you know with a family of three kids who are just used to consuming stuff. I mean, they buy stuff all the time. They, um, you know, and buy experiences, buy goods and services. And, you know, already in the last couple of weeks, I can see that their, their approach to consumption is starting to change. And I think that's a huge uh, relief for me. And, and perhaps we should make the most of this opportunity to sort of recalibrate the way that the global economy works. And that in itself could have huge impacts in our ability to address climate change. Um, I also hope that, there, you know, there will be attempts where you can see the sorts of interventions that are that um, will help address the sort of vulnerability that I've been talking about in terms of, of, of pandemics and the sorts of vulnerabilities I've been talking about in terms of climate change. Because 
it's going to be investment in public services, for example, in, in many of the poorest countries in the world, that's going to help with both. Because if people have that safety net, if people have access, access to good quality, cheap or free universal public services, health services, education, it's those things that will make um, them more resilient, um, make, give them the sources of income that will uh, allow them to uh, withstand these sorts of shocks. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, lead to more sustainable development in communities. And um, so you can, you know, you could see that, you know, there's already talk about what happens um, in the next few years as we recover from COVID. And in fact, Oxfam has signed up to a set of principles called the Just Recovery Principles. And have a look, mm -hmm. um, they've we, been published a few days ago. And in it, we and many, many others are calling for uh, exactly that, a just recovery, that we use this extreme shock to all of our economies and our societies to recalibrate social protection, to make sure that we have a, a, a sort of people's economic stimulus, if you will, that comes into play here to support and nurture those who are being left behind um, as a result. So, uh, you know, there is a there, there are so many uncertainties here, Subana, but I really hope that um, we, can, we can all push for some of that radical change that is needed to make the world a, a more just place as well as a more sustainable place. I think that, um, well, you can't have justice without uh, sustainability in my view, so I think you're absolutely right. And, that, and that, that notion of the just recovery is incredibly important because, as we know, some governments around the world have used this um, um, a crisis in order to become more authoritarian and to sort of gloss over some of the other things that are going on within uh, particular uh, states. So it is kind of also a moment of a bit of danger, really, I think. And so we have to work much more um, uh, positively uh, towards a different kind of a future. So I think that is uh, really, really important. Um, in terms of the governments and uh, of some of those uh, countries around the world that haven't yet been incredibly um, affected, you, you've talked about building um, infrastructure and so on, but are they, I mean, it just seems you've been to those places, I've been to some of those places, and from a sort of standing start, how is that, how is the will and the, um, the, um, the, the resource going to be uh, corralled in order to address not only the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also that climate resilience at the same time. Um, so you're right that, you know, this is an immense challenge. I mean, if we talk about the trillions of dollars that are needed in terms of investment or the huge reductions in carbon emissions that are, um, that are required, and you know required now if you will all of that seems immense but you know one of the reasons i remain optimistic is that when i do see the work that oxfam and others are doing um some of you know there some of the interventions are relatively basic and and relatively straightforward i mean you know we're doing some work on climate resilience in southern africa where you know the the some of the steps that are being taken that will make huge difference are around introducing drought resistant crops so that those farmers who are already close to you know subsistence level um, have access to to good quality seeds of, of varieties and species that will allow for more um, uh, more resilient crops that are less likely to fail or if you think about you know work that we're doing in in west africa around irrigation systems just basic irrigation systems that will allow for more sustainable agriculture will have huge impacts in in that community's resilience um, but of course, you know, make that community more food secure so that if there are extreme shocks like a, a shutdown or of, 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 of society because of a pandemic, people are more likely to be able to feed themselves. So I think it's really important that we do, you know, keep in mind the, the really big ticket items that need to be delivered when it comes to carbon reduction or the sorts of investments needed for adaptation and mitigation. But we also take those sort of small steps, including in our own lives, in terms of some of the behavior changes that I think um, we should all be thinking about, because every little bit will help in, um, in making that just transition. It is interesting when you mentioned children earlier and that kind of um, move to consume everything. We're, we're kind of um, 
almost conditioned into being consumers or thinking of ourselves as consumers and maybe we need to think about a more active kind of citizenship and perhaps again that's something we'll come back to because I've got two really good questions here. One is about um, uh, COVID-19 and the refugee camps from De Haas. Any thoughts on how those camps, particularly those in Calais or Greece, are preparing for this um, uh, disease and the spread of the disease? So we take that one first. Thank you. I think that's a question from Katya. So thanks, Katya. Um, uh, look, uh, that's, I mean, we are deeply worried. Um, again, organizations like Oxfam have been part of that response in the Mediterranean to refugee flows in recent times. Um, and some, you know, it is a, it's distressing um, that the sorts of, those sorts of things were allowed to happen, you know, on at Europe's doorstep where human beings were being treated in the way that they have been, where, where you know, people seek, seeking the most fundamental of human rights, which is to seek refuge from per political persecution, were treated almost as subhuman. Um, and the sort of conditions that have been so extreme um, are now likely to get even worse. That, um, you know, when you know, we talk about self-isolation in, in, in places like London and where most of us, most of us, have that ability to even self-isolate, but how do you how do you self-isolate when you're living cheek by jowl in a tented settlement in in an island in Greece, or indeed in a in a refugee camp in Jordan, or in a slum in India? Um, and this is where you know people are talking about COVID as being the great leveler, and it's true to some mm -hmm. extent that all of us are potentially you know um, going to get this disease in one form or another. But what it hides is a huge disparity in our ability to be able to respond. And not just because of the safety net that our society happens to provide us, but because in the very you know, physical conditions that we live in. And you know, so we are, we're worried about what happens in refugee camps in places like Greece as being a sort of precursor um, to what might happen in the rest of the world that you end up with this sort of very two-tier systems where people go you know become even more nationalists where they hunker down and protect their own you know what they what we have and protect our, our social systems and our um, our healthcare systems and remove access to others and stop providing access if you will for others to be able to cope with that so you know in some ways i know human rights activists have always talked about you know this fact that how we treat refugees and asylum seekers um, is that almost like the sort of canary in the coal mine for wider human rights and um, I think that's been true and, and really worrying in recent times but ever more so with the threat of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. I think with um, a number of unscrupulous politicians as well attempting to use um, that sort of familiar uh, racist rhetoric to conflate uh, refugees, immigrants, and in inverted commas, migrants, whatever, whatever, all into one disease-ridden lump. And so there's a real danger there, I think, that we can retreat into a kind of very selfish um, um, kind of idea of a sense of the nation or a nation and you know, push those people even further to the margins. I think that's something we've all got to, those of us who are really interested in, in human rights and being activists around that, really got to look to that. Yeah. Um, the second question had, um, Danny, is a, is a very interesting one. And I'm hoping that I can say a word or two about this. So this is, what do you think of government bailouts to companies um, that impact in a very negative way on, on, on climate um, in order to see them through this particular uh, crisis. What, what, what's your view on, on government bailouts for companies? What Do you think there should be specific conditions or, or what? Um, look, even before COVID-19 emerged, we and others were very worried about um, effective, you know, state subsidies of one form or another that were still going into um, fossil fuels industries and mm -hmm. there was you know politicians were talking a good talk about climate action but when it came to where they were putting their money we weren't seeing action I mean, even in international development lots of governments including the UK government have made promises that they were going to support sustainable development in other parts of the world and yet there were still funding mechanisms that were investing in coal for example or in other fossil fuel industries around the world and so 
there is a, uh, I think we do have to call out some of the hypocrisy and there are a range of things that I think we can all be doing. I mean, many of, I suspect many members of the conduit community are really well placed to push on some of this agenda. I mean, everything from the way that we invest our resources, you know, the sort of responsible investment and activist investment that um, we could be doing with those of us who do have access to how money is invested all the way to you know consumer trends and and making sure that consumers everywhere in the world are much better informed about the impacts of their um of their consumption and this isn't just about fossil fuels i mean oxfam as many people will know have we have a series mm. of 600 shops around the country where the probably britain's largest recycler of waste clothing um and fashion, for example, is a huge contributor to um, uh, to climate change. In fact, fashion accounts for more than shipping and aviation combined in terms of emissions per year. Um, and so simply by just thinking about our own consumption choices, I think we can be making a huge difference and putting pressure on producers or anyone in that supply chain to think about their climate impacts is going to be really important. But Lola, I know I, you feel strongly about these things. I do feel very strongly indeed about that. And I think, you know, um, this, this will take us into the next question as well, because if we want to move from being somewhat passive consumers to being more active citizens, as you say, we need to be better informed. But we also have to acknowledge the inequalities in our own society as well, so that for some people that's a whole lot easier than it is for others to be active and to research companies and to work out what is the best deal all around for people, planet and for profit. So I think that that's a, a quite a difficult and complex um, area. But also what some people might say is, well, it's all very well, you know, changing us from consumers to citizens, whatever that might mean. But what about the economic model? I mean, is it, is it, is it a truth that we actually need a systemic change or a complete wiping out of the old economic model to be replaced with something else? In some respects, I think you're right that, that there is a move to more responsible investment and uh, the ethical consumer. Um, but at the same time, it feels sometimes like these are, you know, it's the old sticking plaster on a hemorrhage type deal. You know, what is it that we can do um, if we don't change the whole economic model? No, look on the on the citizenship front. I think I I couldn't agree with you more. I think that you know I've, several people. These aren't my ways of characterizing them. Have talked about how you know for most of human history, humans were subjects. We you know we we fitted into power structures and we we're you know almost you know powerless. For the last couple of hundred years, with the advent of capitalism and democracy, we've you know we've been freed, emancipated in many ways, but we've effectively become consumers and very little else. And you know, there needs to come a time and maybe COVID will accelerate this where we need to become, you know, stop being just passive consumers and become active citizens. And I think there is a moment here. And if you connect that with the point you were making earlier, um, Lola, about, you know, is this a moment when humanity retreats into our own comfort zone, into nationalism and, um, um, and, and into our own um, own societies or is this a moment where we realize you know as a species we're both deeply vulnerable and deeply connected to each other and that we have to think of ways that we support each other and uh, and nurture each other you know and so again the optimist in me thinks that that you know I've, I would love to think that the 21st century is indeed the century of the citizen and we find new and uh, you know powerful ways in which we connect it with each other and you know that's why I'm optimistic about the, you know, the, the, the internet and the digital revolution, because we can now disrupt and challenge old power structures in so many amazing ways. And we can connect with each other. We can not only use the internet to socialize, but we can organize and mobilize in, in some really cool ways. And I think that's the potential here. Um, of course, this is no, by no means a done deal, because if you look at the state of civic space you know the ability of citizens to be even able to, to come together to stand together to speak out um we're going backwards and the risk is of course with COVID 19 states will in, you know use as an opportunity to introduce all sorts of other draconian measures including you know deep surveillance on our every move um so there's a lot to play for but i do think if you put all of these bits together there's something really interesting that could come out of this for those of us who are interested in a more just, sustainable world. So how do you, how do you, or how does one or one's organization um, 
influence and challenge governments? And, and let, let, let's first of all talk about it in our own context here in this country, but also think about that wider world too. How, how can you challenge and influence government when it comes to reg, reg, excuse me, regulation and legislation? Because a lot of people I think feel quite sort of impotent, don't feel that they're able to have that influence. For, so for those of us who are in a position which can be seen as being more powerful and influential, what do we actually do? Well, I think I'm still a firm believer that so many of the most dramatic moments in, in human history have, have started with an individual taking off in a very small action. Um, you know, think Rosa Parks, think Martin Luther King, think Greta Thunberg. Um, and uh, so I would, I would be, well, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the power of an individual by any means, and especially in today's connected or hyper-connected age, um, when you don't need to have the backing of a huge media um, house or, a, you know, lots of billions. And that, those matter because, of course, you know, the, the, power, the rich and the powerful are trying to control every means they can. But on the other hand, there are ways to dissent and disrupt some of those systems. Um, but I think that there are, you know, you can, I still believe that there is room for, you know, excellent evidence-based um, um, advocacy. I think that there is room for working with a coalition and, and unusual coalitions of actors who can come together. And let's not forget the impact of, of businesses and the, and the private sector. You know, some of the most progressive people I know don't work in civil society, don't work in policy, but actually are social entrepreneurs and business people trying to you know, make some really radical changes in how the economy works. And um, I'm, so I'm really glad you said that. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Now, I'm really glad you said that about the, the coalition piece. So perhaps we can expand on that a little bit, because I do think that sometimes in the past, perhaps we've been a bit blinkered about the people that we think we can work with. Those of us who are kind of in this sort of space let, let's call it that so so what are some of those coalitions that you've seen that that really do work or are working and and how would you suggest going forward on that and i think this is also perhaps a moment where we can say well what can conduit members do because i, I think you know particularly for our membership there are a bunch of people who really want to be involved we're not content to sort of sit around moaning about how dreadful everything is without doing anything so again what what are the kinds of collaborative efforts we can make what kinds of alliances can we make do they need to be big things like um similar to for example make poverty history do they have to have a big sort of personality and um uh, celebrity fronting you know what what kinds of unusual, particularly unusual um, collaborations do you think are effective? So I think, um, uh, I mean, for me, I, the, the most important thing is impact and making sure that, you know, whatever you do has, you know, you're clear about the impact that you want and you give yourself the best chance of making that impact. And, you know, I, I sometimes think that there's a lot of, lot of hype and a lot of talk about some of these big collaborations but there's not very much you know there's a lot of you know just as there's sort of you know greenwashing there's sort of cause washing that goes on that um that i do worry a bit about um but you know if you take the humanitarian sector you know oxfam was founded in 1942 because eight individuals came together voluntarily um to create the oxford committee on famine relief to provide, to raise money for famine relief in Greece because Greece was under Nazi occupation and the Allies had a policy of blockading any food supplies that would go behind Nazi lines. And these eight people said that's not, you know, that's um, um, not right. And they raised money to support the Greek Red Cross to provide food relief. But those eight people also said, but it's not enough just to save lives. We need to be able to influence policy. And so they started a campaign which was eventually successful to change allied policy on, on what was called total war and the food blockade. And I think, you know, there are many, many countless examples of, of where that sort of considered action against by eight individuals who had no big connections. Um, um, and, you know, if you take today, some of the more, most interesting things I see happening in the humanitarian sector are where, um, you know, private sector companies are working with, with NGOs on, on how to provide uh, services into refugee camps where people, you know, training and employability courses are, are being provided, where cash transfer systems are revolutionizing the way that you know, the economies in some of these most fragile places work. 
Um, and so I think there, there are some uh, clever things to do. And so I know, you know, when it comes to, well, what can conduit members do? Um, I mean, there are some obvious things that I, that I hope people will consider. I mean, one is obviously time and money. Um, you know, I have a, you know, a sense that in this particular crisis, um, time might be as important as money because, you know, it's the time that we're each of us is going to spend on helping our neighbours that's going to matter a, a lot. Um, it's the um, the time, whether that's physically by going and doing their shopping or just calling in to provide some some comfort to people who might otherwise be feeling lonely and isolated. Money as well, because if you know, in terms of what's going to happen, the scale of response. Uh, um, we published a report actually just today saying that $160 billion is needed in the short term in cash and debt relief to help the poorest countries in the world deal with the immediate impacts of COVID-19. So that's $160 billion. That's a huge, you know, much, much more than the $2 billion the UN has asked for in recent days to help its response to COVID relief. So um, time and money will matter. But I think there's also... You know, in, in recent days, I've been talking to colleagues about what happens when our when when this turns from a public health response in the global south into an economic response. So, you know, in, in many parts of the global north, including in the UK, we've seen a set of public health responses around you know staying home and isolation and washing our hands. But we've also seen unprecedented fiscal response to provide cash into the pockets of some individuals, self-employed people, but also businesses to keep the economy going, to keep people um, functioning. Now, what's going to happen in a Yemen or a DRC or a Bangladesh in a few weeks' time when the pandemic strikes in a big way there? Because those governments are unlikely to have access to finance streams and are, or, or, or maybe even unwilling to provide resources in the way they do. And so I've been talking to colleagues about, you know, how, how might we move resource cash in this problem into the pockets of key workers, you know, health workers in, in some of these countries, or just carers, people who are at home looking after young people, the elderly or the sick. Um, and in fact, I had a very good conversation with MasterCard on Friday night and a couple of other conversations today. And, you know, I would love to hear ideas from conduit members about, you know, just let's think ahead for the next few weeks and few months about this recovery in some of these most fragile, vulnerable places. How might we move resources in? Because um, we can't probably move food in the way that we once did, and, you know, and we can't have global supply chains, but you might have local interventions and we might be able to move cash. And if there are a great ideas that conduit community members can come up with, I would love to, to hear them. So I, th I think that that is a resource that is often um, not counted in, as it were, which is creative thinking around mm. these issues and thinking otherwise around these issues, trying to think through the problem in a slightly different way and also drawing on those people from the various diasporas, you know, what is their experience of having, um, uh, you know, being sort of situated in, in, in the north, as it were, but also still having connections in the global south. How can we tap into some of those creative um, energies and also the thinking? So I, I'm really interested in how we can think through these issues in a slightly different way, which will come maybe a little bit before or simultaneously with the other kinds of things that we need to have. On, on, on your, 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 that um, sum of 160 billion, it's a kind of mind boggling amount, isn't it? But I read this um, thread on, on Twitter. I can't remember the, all of the details, but it was really interesting because apparently I think some top tech bosses have gotten together and were going to donate something like $25 million to, to, to fight this disease. And you think, oh, that's a lot of money. And then first of all, A, it is not a lot of money in relation to the 160 billion. But also, as this thread pointed out, this particular comment was based on what um, this couple who were tweeting earned and using the same percentage as those billionaires, at the same percentage of their income as the billionaires, they'd be donating something like $4. Because actually, as a proportion of the amount of money that the billionaires had, you know, 25 million was, was just a drop in the ocean. So again, it's about rethinking what it is that we expect of people in leadership roles, we expect of the economic system to deliver when, you know, it's all very well in the good times when some people are raking it in, but what happens at times like this when you really need to pull out all the stops to do things differently?
So I'm really interested. Again, it comes back to your sort of post, you know, the recovery period. What are our principles? What are going to be the underlying principles in relation uh, to that? And even the, 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 the 160 billion figure is only about 10 percent of what the U.S. has already announced as part of its fiscal stimulus just for the U.S. Mm. So mm. we're not talking about a huge amount of money in those terms, especially when mm. a lot of that is sitting in debt and it's just debt relief. Because as we know, a lot of poorer countries are still stuck in um, in serving old debt. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've got a question which is quite an interesting one. Um, it's specifically related to a particular movie um, that was made in 2011 called Contagion. And the question from Supana Mahotra is, you know, if Hollywood could foresee this issue of the disease, how come all of these Western govern governments have, didn't see it in advance? But I have to say that there is quite a long tradition of books, novels, um, um, probably even movies, if I could sort of rake back through my movie history head, um, that, you know, this idea of the disease. So the most famous one I can think of, and apparently sales of this have gone sort of through the roof, is uh, La Peste in, in French or The Plague in English by Albert Camus. And it's a very, it's very interesting as a metaphor in that particular instance. But, you know, there is this thing about, the, the, there is something about the notion of a disease that kind this invisible thing that in spite of all of our sophistication and all of our knowledge and all in the, in the west and all of the um resources that we have we still find it really hard to combat this tiny thing you can't even see so there's something that 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 it does to the um popular imagination that makes it particularly scary yeah no, and I think, you know, and scientists have been of all sorts have been writing about the risks of, of this deeply integrated global economy, particularly with the way that we use livestock and animals in our food systems. You know, we have exposed out, we've created this problem at the scale and, and because of those linkages that we've created for trade and the movement of people, uh, we're so vulnerable. Um, and, you know, there is something, there's a sort of blind spot. I mean, compare the trillions of dollars that are spent on defending ourselves from each other in terms of the arms race. Um, mm. But then the sort of, you know, me, you know measly um, uh, allocation to global health initiatives, particularly in the, in the global south. And I think that's a, a problem. But I wouldn't, you know, the, the reality of, of disease and the vulnerability um, that many people feel um, shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, we work on cholera response and there are millions of people who are still being affected by cholera, an entirely preventable mm -hmm. disease if you just invest in clean water and some good sanitation programs. And yet, you know, I've seen firsthand in Yemen, in Zimbabwe, um, in, in uh, DRC, the impacts that uh, contemporary outbreaks of cholera are having on people's lives. Um, and there is it's the, you know, that's the tragedy here that, that I hope, you know, there's both this idea that, you know, we as humans are deeply vulnerable. We can't just sort of live in our little digital bubble of, of wonderfulness and think that we can't, we're untouchable. Um, but also this reality that for the vast majority of people on the planet, this is what life feels like. Um, mm -hmm. And that vulnerability, you know, it's morally, it's a stain on our moral conscience, our collective moral conscience that we have let this happen, that um, we've chronically underinvested in the ability of some of our fellow humans to be able to protect themselves uh, and offer them even the basic notion of, of human dignity um, while we've ensconced ourselves in our own little bubble. And I think, um, I hope this, you know, we use, the, you know, once we manage this immediate impact of this pandemic, we use as an opportunity to redraw, recalibrate, reset some of those relationships. And part of that resetting, I think, goes back to what you were saying earlier about collaborating with various organisations and institutions and indeed business, which takes me to a question that we have here from Tanya, which is in the context of Bangladesh, have you thought about um, collaborating with Grameen Bank? Is that something that, that, that um, Oxfam is doing or with, or with a similar organisation? Yeah, I hope so. And um, so we have a, a big program in Bangladesh and I know they work with the Grameen Bank, whether they are on this context or not, I will check and I'll follow that up. But I was having a conversation about Bangladesh today, actually. And Lola, this might interest you, given your interest in in modern slavery. You know, Bangladesh, mm. as we know, is um, uh, is a huge source of much of the clothing that we buy through um, you know supply chains in the in the textile industry. And 
you know, we all have lots of concerns about the about human slavery and, and the protection of workers in an industry that's notorious for exploiting people. Um, and we you know we live in a society where I just saw the other day a study that says, you know, 75% of UK businesses have some concern about modern slavery in their supply chains today. Um, and yet I heard a story uh, from a colleague of, or a fact that 240,000 garment workers who have been working in the factory supplying one major fashion retailer in the in the UK have been laid off in recent weeks because orders have been cancelled and this particular fashion retailer has not paid their suppliers just because they've gone back to the terms of their contract so already all of a sudden we've got in a country like Bangladesh and this is just one example you know potentially millions of people who are already living fairly marginal economic lives um, who've had their source of income now shut down. Um, and, you know, I, I do think, I mean, I wonder though, you know, just as my children aren't buying their fast fashion and, um, and their clothes in, in the UK, maybe they could be doing something to sort of reconnect with those people um, who were producing their clothes anyway. Um, but in this time of extreme need, can we connect our, our, you know, people with each other? And that's the sort of ideas that I'd be grateful for. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that um, it's a bit of a, how can I put it, again, you know, earlier comments that you made about um, the interconnectedness that we've built up around the world is not always necessarily a positive form of interconnectedness. So there's this interdependence, but it always seems to mean that the mo most vulnerable um, always stay, as it were, at, at the bottom, if I can use that as a metaphor. So I'm thinking, you know, yes, um, some people are saying, oh, this is a great moment to recalibrate our connections with clothing and all the rest of it. And, you know, we don't have to be dependent on outsourcing um, clothing, the making of garments overseas. And then you think about all those people who potentially will lose that work, many of whom, most of whom will be women. And, and therefore, you know, this is a huge, huge problem. So it, it, it's almost, it feels like, and I'm not trying to be put a downer on things, but I just think the scale of the challenge is huge. And that's why we need so many more people to engage with it in an active way, which is how do we get that? How do we keep the interconnected bit, the bits that are good? And how do we ensure that, that, that we can lift um, those people in poverty out of that poverty without trying to reproduce the same old economic model? So it comes back to a question, that would answer uh, that was asked um, earlier. Also, just to say, yes, I've got a question in from Simon here, which is it's really about leadership, and this is something I'm particularly interested in. What are the some what are some of the assumptions that underpin what we think about as good, strong leadership? Do we need different models of how you lead? What does it even mean, leadership today? Wow. Um... Well, uh, I think leadership in part is, you know, having to try to manage an organization that, you know, itself is pr um, facing huge risks. Because by the way, you know, we're not unusual yeah. charities, businesses, all sorts of organizations have, um, you know, some of the basic assumptions we've made about our business and operational model uh, uh, have just been sort of pulled out from underneath us. And, you know, I think as a, as a leader of sorts, I'm trying to just grapple with the sort of pace of change, a, a sort of unpredictability of this um, of this situation that is challenging me in ways that are, are, are you know, really unsettling. Um, uh, and I think that's, that might be a, you know, a sign of the times. And people have said, you know, um, the pace of change in society has never been as quick, but it'll never again be this slow. And so I think mm -hmm. that there is a, a challenge for leaders of all sorts to be able to lead in these circumstances. Um, and I think there's also a, a, an opportunity here for, you know, maybe one might call it radical leadership that, you know, the sort of leadership that ends up with tinkering here and there is unlikely to make the sort of impact that we need um, on any of the questions we've spent discussing over the last hour or so, you know, and, and there are lessons here around, um, COVID about consumption, we've just talked about that. You know, if you think that climate change is the, you know, largest ever market failure in human history, because we've been able to consume endlessly without actually accounting for the full price of our consumption, leadership will be about resetting that in meaningful ways. Um, some of it, you know, safety nets, let's talk about the social protection. We've taken for granted in parts of the West, especially in Europe, 
that there will be this guaranteed minimum that no one will fall below. And perhaps it's real time for us to think about that for every human being. Um, and I hope that leadership will take us in that direction. And Lola, you talked about, you know, the impact on women and, and gender equality. I think there's a huge gender equality dimension here. Um, you know, this is calling into question, particularly for those of us in the West who have now been, you know, stuck at home with families, um, the gender division of labor, the sort of the gender inequality that's still there. My wife will tell you that, you know, we've been stuck with the kids for the last few days together, but she's doing the brunt, taking the brunt of, of much of the domestic duties, because even though we think of ourselves as a modern couple, um, we've got some, you know, pretty old habits when it comes to, to, uh, to gender equality, or even this notion of care. You know, care is a chronically undervalued part of, 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 of the modern economy, and yet it's essential for, for keeping us all going, for feeding the economy, if you will. Um, and it tends to be done by women, especially in the global south, where it's completely unpaid. And, um, and so leadership might also be about, you know, challenging some of those fundamental assumptions around, um, around gender inequality. As you, as you were speaking, I was thinking, okay, what could we do? Maybe there's sort of, um, you know, there's an assumption, I think, and maybe this slightly underpins that last question, an assumption that the leaders are the people at the top, you know, and that they're the people who run organisations. So they're already in place when they just have to take up this mantle of leadership in these very difficult times. But I'm wondering if there's another way we can think of leadership that is much more community-based or, uh, you know, based in within a particular uh, region and that is done in a, in a slightly different way. It's not necessarily what we sometimes call the great and the good at the top mm. of organizations or whatever. How can we redistribute, it's, it's, it's kind of redistribute the, the, the leadership um, uh, rather than having it focused and concentrated in, in quite small numbers really because i think that's part of the problem and i i'd love to have the kind of setup whereby it was possible to say okay here's a group of people from a community and this is how we'd like to reconstruct that community for when covid19 has finally sort of gone or at least gone for you know another few years or so um you know what we we could be putting in place now um, yeah. through, um, you know, and, and then also supporting that kind of work in those countries that are yet to be affected uh, to the extent that we have. Mm. No, I agree with you. I mean, it takes me back to where we started this conversation, which is, you know, I was planning to to share with people the sort of new strategy for Oxfam, part of which was about um, participation that, again, you know, uh, this is a wonderful organization with this long and proud history, but it's also um, a very traditional institution, if you think about it, you know, we're, we're big, we've got thousands of people, we have turnover of close to a billion euro globally, um, and we're a brand, and we have professionals who work inside offices doing things, and we often deal with communities and beneficiaries um, all over the world, but there are huge power imbalances between us and those people we are serving. And to me, you know, the aspiration for Oxfam is actually to try to sort of turn some of that inside out to become much more participatory in everything that we do in the way that we deal with our supporters you know year in year out millions of people in the UK for example support Oxfam I'd love to engage those people in much more meaningful ways help you know work with them to co-create our programs our interventions connect them with each other in more meaningful ways and connect them with the people we work with elsewhere and all the way to the you know to the other end where um you know, organi aid organizations like us are much more conscious about the power that we hold, including about preventing the abuse of power. So that, and, and the, the best way to do that is to create really, um, you know, high functioning feedback loops that, that empower people and, and make people part of your own decision making process. And that you, so that you become accountable to them, as well as to your donors and your funders who may be far away. And you know, I, I, you know, I'm really hoping that we don't get, dis, you know, too distracted from that journey because that is the challenge, especially for those sort of big 20th century institutions, whether they're political, like the ones that, that you sit in in, in Westminster, or or, or non-governmental, like the ones that I'm in, or even the big traditional corporate models. You know, my sense is, you know, at best we've got a decade or two um, of life left in us unless we dramatically change the way that our that the power works within our institutions. Um, otherwise, we're going to be shut out. <laughs>
and certainly not the sort of current generation who who expect much more fluid, liquid ways of of interacting with each other. Mm, and and all our in, in, excuse me, that means all of our institutions. And um, Supana's come back and said, you know, there is a movement to shape organisational structures in order to be flatter. What? How could we do that in relation to government? You know, is there a way of doing that that makes um, uh, that um, that could rebuild the trust in politicians? Because we haven't really talked about this very much. But one of the things I, I'm sensing from people is there's such a deep mistrust of politicians. This is why you know those conspiracy theories can flourish to the extent they do because nobody trusts anybody else. But maybe there's a different way of organising. Um, government in its broadest sense that would enable us to regain some, rebuild some of that trust. Yeah. No, I agree. I think the, the, the days of the sort of um, the Victorian notion, if you will, of, of, of democracy built on, you know, uh, casting a ballot once, once every few years and then trusting someone else to do it is just as outdated as, as, you know, putting yourself as a sort of intermediary between, you know, the trusted black box or green box that you know, simply collects money from one part of the world and goes and distributes it elsewhere. Those are very tired models. And I think, um, you know, if you take uh, democracy or political participation, you know, how do we build much more sophisticated peer-to-peer -peer networks where participation is built into the system from the very get-go? You know, and I, uh, people like Neil Lawson call this liquid democracy. Um, mm. So there's different ways of, of, of describing it. And I think that is, that, you know, the challenge there is, a lot of the really interesting bits of the digital transformation that I'm seeing are, are doing that, but they're doing that outside traditional institutions. You know, people are organizing and, you know, if you go to the sort of the cutting edge of what's happening in Silicon Valley or online or in, in, in places like China, um, they're doing some of that, but they're doing it because they're trying to create new social enterprises or new digital platforms or whatever else it is. But I think we need to sort of now bring some of that learning back into these traditional institutions, whether they're governmental or non-governmental in particular. But that is so interesting because I think, you know, there was that hope was um, uh, invested in what is now, you know, Silicon Valley as being it, it, it's, it's almost as if some of those things that were more disruptive from the way they organize themselves with the flatter um, organizational structures to the working environment or radically different, you know, and then they turn out to be the same in terms of chasing the profit. So how can, you know, the question is, I'm not expecting you to answer that right now, but, you know, how can we waylay, how can we use the best of those developments without getting still along these absolute train lines of you know hurtling towards this kind of economic nirvana which only exists for a tiny tiny proportion of, of the world um, just moving on to what I suspect might be our, our final question which is about another challenge within the sector that um, that NGOs sometimes perpetuate grant-based systems and that therefore NGOs perpetuating the same old power dynamics and don't really change systems. So it's a little bit like one of those vicious circles, perhaps, that is being sort of described there by Deepa Mirchandani. Um, is it a misallocation of resources that don't create sustainable development, really? There's a challenge for you, Danny. Yeah, no, a great place to end. Look, I, th I mean, I think we are at a moment when we have to question some of those basic assumptions of the economic model. And those of us in different ways, whether we work in corporate, social enterprises, government, NGOs like I do, um, have to question whether we really are part of the problem or part of the solution. And if we're simply tinkering with a system that has delivered, you know, climate breakdown, one of the most unequal periods in human history, a period when we, you know, are susceptible to these um, pandemics, despite having the resources and the know-how to to um, to, uh, to stop them or, or reduce their impact. Um, you know, I think that is the big question. Is this a moment for us to pivot? And, you know, the good news is there's lots of historical precedent. If you think about moments of great societal progress, they have happened after huge disruptions like world wars or, um, or or disease and i think that for those of us who who want a more, who have progressive ideals again we have a lot to get through over the next few weeks and months um, but i really hope this is a moment when we can reflect on on what we can do to really take advantage of this moment for that pivot mm. 
Yes, I think also there are those, um, you know, whenever I think of the great movements, whenever I'm trying to G people up and say, don't give up hope, you know, it's like it took 250, 300 years to start to get rid of the transatlantic slave trade. It took how many centuries before women uh, were enabled to, to vote. And I think those, those, again, it goes back to something you said earlier, it's about the small things that everybody can do, but by the same token, you know, we can't wait for those things to happen organically. We have to kind of keep pushing and looking for those new ideas that will inspire and make that progressive change that, that, that so many of us want to see. But Danny, I'll let you have the last word. No, thank you. Just simply say thank you. That's been a fun conversation. I hope it has been those for those people who are watching us. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think maybe um, we should get together and have a think about this leadership thing, because I have got some ideas about that. And I'd be very interested to hear from Conduit members what ideas they have about leadership as well. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you so much, Lola. It's been a fantastic conversation and one I think we could have continued for many more hours. Um, it strikes me that this leadership question is a great follow-up webinar. So um, maybe send your ideas over to program at theconduit.com or any thoughts you might have. Um, and then I will circle back with Danny and Lola for a, a future conversation on the future of leadership, which again, probably will take us hours to dive into, but would be a, a great thing for the Conduit community to come together around. Um, so anyway, thank you so much, Lola, for joining us this evening and for your incredibly insightful questions. Danny, thank you again for joining us. Um, the best of luck with everything with Oxfam. We will be sending everybody um, a kind of follow-up note with ways in which you can stay in touch. Um, and maybe what we'll do is try and get Danny to pin him down to a few different ways in which he'd love to see the Conduit community help support. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you again to Danny and Lola. Take care and see you soon.